Well, this morning we will continue our study on uh, First John. <coughs> we introduce this with a theme on uh, assurance of our salvation. Assurance is very, very difficult to get if you are in religion. By the way, this is one of the ways you will know whether you are just religious or you are a person of faith. A religious person will never get assurance. When you, when you begin to see Christians wondering, am I going to go to heaven or not, they are still into their religion, okay? Because relationship gives the assurance. And before I got born again, I was with the Roman Catholic tradition, and we don't know if we're going to go to heaven. Most probably, you'll go to hell. That's the belief. And then, if uh, God is a little bit gracious, you'll go to purgatory. You know where the word purgatory comes from? It, it comes from the word purge or purgation. That's what you do when you have diarrhea and you go to the bathroom. You are being purged. Okay? That is what purgatory literally means. And so, if you are very bad, maybe the fires of hell will be up to your chest. And if they offer prayers, maybe it will go down until it's ankle deep, then you can jump out. That doesn't give any assurance at all. Okay, there is a novel written about a mafia boss in New York. And uh, he was caught by the FBI. And so he was going to be executed. So he, he told his lawyer, make, make all the appeals so I can be free for around a month, he said, so I can go around New York. So he went, he went to his priest and he said, priest, I am, I am going to be executed or I will die in jail. I have a lot of enemies and so if they put me in jail awaiting my appeal, I may get killed in jail. And so uh, the priest says, okay, you need to have a regular mass on your behalf. And said, yes, priest, I want to make sure that uh, I don't stay long in uh, purgatory. And the priest says, we can do that. Our roof is in shambles. It needs some, some repair. It needs around, during that time, $40,000. And the mafia boss says, done, for as long as you pray for me. What else do you need? Well, I want to make sure that my family also is prayed for. And this and that, well, our church needs repair, not just the roof. And so if you will help, and the, the list goes on. And uh, eventually he paid a lot of money to make sure that the mass is said on his behalf. But he went out the meeting with the priest without assurance. That's what religion does. Religion will not give you any assurance that you're going to heaven. But relationship does. When you have a true relationship with God, which is not religion, you know that God is your Father, Jesus is your Savior, and you believe that Jesus died on the cross for you, on your behalf. On the third day, he was raised back to life. And uh, after being here for uh, around 40 days, he, he ascended uh, to heaven and uh, sat on the right hand of the Father. According to the, uh, to the church creed, Nicene Creed, that's the fundamentals of the faith. And so when you begin to believe that, there is this assurance in your heart. I don't know how, how it, it works, but it's by faith. The moment I gave my life to Jesus, I knew I was going to go to heaven. You say, where did the assurance come from? It comes from faith. The Holy Spirit bears witness. But religion takes it away from us. Now, God's call is not for any of you to be religious. So if you say, well, I have no assurance of salvation, you are religious. Okay? I'm telling you, you are religious. Now, I may have some problems with my parents growing up and with my siblings. But I'll tell you this. My parents are my parents. Okay? And my, my kuya, I have not seen him in I don't know how long. Do you know how long, DJ? When was the last time I saw my kuya? Uh, I think I saw him once or twice after I came back to the Philippines. I don't know when was the last time I saw him. But you know he's my kuya. Yeah. 
That's a relationship. I have not seen him in over 10 years. He is my kuya. Yeah. I, uh, I see my family whenever I go on missions. I tell my, at one time my mother was uh, whining. <clears throat> Tatampo. He, he, she told me, oh, see how come whenever you go to the Philippines, we are always the last. You visit us the last. And when you come here, you don't spend a lot of time. Because I don't, you know. Because uh, if my kids are with me, the, uh, their nose bleeds profusely. And there is no AC in the house that my mother owns. And so, uh, I don't want to sleep there also. <laughs> you know? uh, and it's, it's, it's too small, really. So he was, she was upset with me. And so I just look at her and says, Nanai, you have to be grateful I come. Because I said, if I'm not serving God and I'm not going on missions, I don't have the means to fly to the Philippines twice a year. I just don't have it. The, 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 so I know when I go to the Philippines, my priority is missions, not my family there. Some people got that confused. No, it's, it's not my family. Uh, it is because... I cannot afford to fly to the Philippines twice a year if not permission. So I told my mother, we have to be thankful to the Lord that uh, that is the case, that we can see each other twice or sometimes three times a year. And, and that's it. You know, it's, uh, that settles everything. But what is that? No whining anymore after that. It's a relationship. It doesn't matter if she gets upset with me. She is, is still my mother. No, my mother gets upset with me. I... I really refuse to get upset with my mother. But uh, in, the, in that case, the relationship established. It's not religion. You know, it's, not even, it's not even the last name. Uh, I could have changed my last name when I became an American citizen. Uh, some, some Filipinos have changed their, their name when they become citizens. Uh, at one time, we have a Filipino that I know that he changed his name to James Bond. You know? and, Anybody here wants to change your name to Jack Ryan or, or uh, Jack Richard or something? That will be fun, you know. But uh, you can do that. But relationship is something else. The only way you can break that relationship is if you break the covenant of bond in that relationship. Okay? I, uh, I, I counseled uh, feuding couples and some of them will say, well, I don't love him anymore. I don't love her anymore. And I'll begin to give a little bit of quiz. Well, when, when he or she is hungry, are you concerned? Yes. So do you want to buy him food? Yes. Then you're still kind. The Bible says love is kind. You see, we, we begin to think that love is a feeling. It's not. Love is a relationship. Okay? And so when you begin to think that way, assurance in our salvation comes from our faith relationship with Jesus. Well, I'm still not sure. Then get your faith straightened up. If your faith is not zeroing on Jesus, you will have no assurance of salvation. And no religion can give you that. The other problem that we have seen is this. When we begin to live outside the dictates of this relationship, because relationships... By, by its very definition, you relate, relationship, relate. You can relate with somebody when you have something in common. That's where we will get our topic this morning, fellowship. The only reason why there is a fellowship is because you share something in common. If there is nothing in common, then there's nothing to fellowship with or nothing to have relationship with, okay? And so what we have seen is... Uh, they develop a division, a big-time schism in the church. One is caused by those people who believe that they are already perfect and they don't sin anymore. But that is a lie because you and I, after we get saved, we still, we still sin. I mean, again, any, any other relationship. Have you, have you had a, a, a feud with somebody with, with the, that you love or a friend of yours? And so you mend, you mend the relationship, you say, I'm sorry. And right after you say, I'm sorry, you did it again. Okay? We keep on sinning. Because of, of uh, the fallen nature of the flesh. We have been saved, our spirit has been renewed. 
But our flesh, as we have been studying last week, have memories of sin. And it likes to remember sin. And the moment there is an impetus or an encouragement, it can easily go back to sin unless you renew your mind. So, I uh, quoted to you the statement of Martin Luther and Karl Barth when they were having difficulty with fellow Christians. What they said in common is, we don't have the same spirit. And uh, the Shiism in the church today is like that. You look at other Christians and other groups, and you can look at them square in the eye and say, we don't have the same spirit. And I'll, I'll tell you this. I, in, in my encounter with a lot of churches and, and ministers, a lot of these people, we don't have the same spirit. I, I have a student that uh, is now a bishop in the Philippines, and in my first seminar last, last uh, a couple of weeks ago, he showed up on one of the sessions, Brother Willie was teaching, on the last, last 15 minutes. And he was, he was asking, he was asking uh, if, I, if he can have time with me. You know, because the last time we met here in Chicago, I, I just essentially told him, you have to warn a pastor to stop preaching. Because uh, he is an adulterer, and he was the main reason why my uh, brother died, you know. And so I said, he needs to be restored back to God. I said, if he doesn't step down, when I go back to the Philippines, I will deal with him. I will uh, use what I have to make sure he's exposed. Because a minister like that shouldn't be going around preaching the gospel. Immediately, my student backed up and said, oh, I really don't know him. Prior to that, he said that he knows him and he trained him. What is that? He is condoning a sinful person. We don't have the same spirit. And the reason why he wants to meet with me is because those, there are some people like that who goes around giving their business cards, looking for places to preach. And I tell that in my meetings, this is not the church to do that. If a person is just looking for a place to preach in the U.S. so they can collect a little bit of offering, Lion's Heart is not the place. I have friends who came here, they want to preach. I entertain them, I take them out for lunch or something, give them a little love gift, but uh, they don't preach. Why? Because we don't have the same spirit. And you have, you have to uh, remind yourself that not everybody is of the same spirit. That's why we are told, test every spirit. Not because somebody labeled themselves as Christians, it doesn't mean they are Christians, okay? It doesn't mean they are Christians. They need to have a personal relationship with God. So, another thing that uh, we've lost uh, through the years because of religion is our call. And that is to be a witness. Say, I am a witness. I am a witness. Say it again. First John chapter 1. Uh, let, me, let me read to you again verses 1 to 4. What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, and we have observed and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. That life was revealed and we have seen it, and we testify and declare to you that eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. What we have seen and heard, we also declare to you, so that you may also have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that your joy may be complete. There it is. Because we receive testimonies we have been witness to. It's like uh, the faith community is like a link. It's a chain. You know. A chain has many links. But by design, for example, if you will go to Home Depot, they have different sizes of chains. And it will tell you the kind of pressure it can take. There are chains, like, like for example, we have a chain here. I think each of this chain is uh, rated 1,500 1, uh, PSI. 
that's, that's uh, another uh, pounds, rather, it can take. Now, of course, that's overdoing it. There are four chains. And the reason why I ever did this, that's oversized, uh, the chain, is because I don't want the thing falling on our heads. You know? So the whole thing, this whole lighting system, what, maybe around two, less than 200 pounds. But the chain that is carrying it can take uh, over 2,000 pounds, so to speak. Yeah. Why they do that? I don't want that falling on our heads. Okay? Now, look at these chains. It has so many links. They are cast on the same size and weight. Why? If one chain is bigger and there are smaller chains, if you put pressure, the weaker link will break it apart. Because it will, if, if the other chains can handle 2,000 pounds and this little chain, well, it, it has to connect. I don't have the same size anymore, so I'll just put this little chain. I only need a little one. But that chain can only handle 100 pounds, 100 PSI. You put 200 PSI, the other links can handle it, but this link can't handle it. It will break the chain, okay? Witnesses are like that. We belong to the same chain. You and I, we are links, okay? I will explain this more to you guys later. But we are links. Therefore, we can handle the same pressure by design. We can handle the same pressure. We have been given the same truth. No difference. The revelation that John got from God is the same revelation that we receive because it keeps being passed on. The difference is this. The way they take the revelation they receive and use it to witness. And the way we are taking that revelation and not using it to witness. For example... If you will look at Paul right now and you will say, Paul, what can you say about idol worship? He will, he will condemn it. He will say, well, you know, uh, Romans chapter 1, four-footed beast and all of these things, it's abomination before the Lord. Right now, there is a lot of, uh, a lot of Christian evangelicals that are going into statues and going into idol worship. They, they think it's, it's okay. Uh, there, there is even a theology on... Uh, on icons right now, iconology. And so, you can tell that that is not the same message. They have a different Bible, okay? Some denominations right now, they are okay with, with same-sex marriage, and they are okay with uh, homosexuality and lesbianism. Well, that is a different link. It cannot handle any pressure at all. And so, what happened is, the church is so split and so divided, why will people believe us then? And can you imagine if John and I were in, in a boat and I was talking with this Presbyterian minister and he was trying to talk to me, finding out, you know, Christianity in the Philippines. And so John was listening and I stopped him for a, right away. I said, listen, I said, you, well, because he's white, you know, and I'm not trying to be racist, but he happens to be white. I said, you white folks need to do a lot of apology. And he looked at me and says, what do you mean? I said, because you know when you first brought the gospel to the Philippines, I said, there are Presbyterians, Methodists, Pentecostals, Baptists. I said, all of you guys, when you first went to the Philippines, you taught us to live right. You taught us that a minister should not, uh, uh, not be divorced and remarried. You taught us that homosexuality is wrong. You taught us the following things. I said, this is what you taught us. You taught us to read our Bible. You taught us the Bible is the word of God. And I said, what happened to you guys? I said, what do you mean? I said, you changed all of that. And now you still want to go to the Philippines and teach the changes. I said, you, you mess it up. And he was looking at me and he says, you're right. I said, I am right. I said, because I heard the gospel that was preached to me during the, the 70s, and it has changed, and you're the same people preaching it, same denominations. What happened? There was a problem with our witness, the consistency, okay? And so this morning, well, today rather, let's talk about witness uh, in fellowship. If we're going to 
have a meaningful fellowship, we need to have the same witness. Okay, let's start reading on verse 5. This is where we'll pick up from last week. 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light, and there is absolutely no darkness in him. Now, these are simple words, but look, look at the uh, assurance here. There is absolutely no darkness in him. If we say we are, if we say we have fellowship with him, and yet we walk in darkness, we are lying and are not practicing the truth. Verse 7, if we walk in the light, as he himself is in the light. <coughs> Again, if we walk in the light, as he is in the light. So we are both in the light. Look at this. We have fellowship with one another. That's the base of fellowship. The, the basis of true Christian fellowship is not because we are both Baptists or we are both Methodists or both Presbyterians. No. The basis is he's walking in the light we are walking on the same light. Because we are both in the light, then we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. Again, these are all in the present tense, present active indicative, meaning continuous. And the blood, if we continue walking in the light, as He is continuously in the light, then we continue to have fellowship with one another. That means that fellowship can be broken if we stop walking in the light. We continue to fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus continue to be effective in cleansing us from our sins. The efficacy of the blood of Jesus remains in us. Okay? So, if we say we have no sin, some, some of the uh, belief system that we studied last week is they say, well, it's a status and we don't sin anymore. So John is... Uh, Fighting that. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Again, assurance. Verse 10. If we say we have not sinned, we make Him a liar and his word is not in us. Chapter 2, verse 1. My, my little children, I am writing you these things so that you may not sin. Now that, that's, first he said, if we say we have not sinned, we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. <laughs> and we make him a liar. And then he comes back on chapter 2, verse 1. I am writing you these things so that you may not sin. That's, that's a loaded statement right now so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, then he comes back, comes back. Because you, that you may not sin. Whoa, John, you know. What do you mean you may not sin? And so he comes back and says, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate to the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He himself is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only for ours, but also for those of the whole world. Now let's <coughs> let's talk about uh, fellowship. I already said that fellowship is literally sharing in common. That's fellowship, sharing in common. So first of all, fellowship is a walk. Okay, say it with me. Fellowship, fellowship. is a walk. Is a walk. Say it again. Is a walk. Unless we are walking together. We are not in fellowship. Two people cannot walk together unless they agree. Um, I mean, marriage is the same. Marriage can stay if the couple will walk together. Okay? I mean, they are in the same direction. And that is where the negotiation takes place. I, I keep saying, if, if it's my will, I want to go back to the Philippines yesterday. Uh... I want to be able to train more there and, and do more things there. My wife doesn't like it. Yeah. She has certain requirements. You know, she has 
certain health needs. And I told her, let's, let, let's build a house in the Philippines. And she said, yes, but these are the conditions. Now, I, I, cannot, I cannot just simply, you know, some, some couples are so foolish, they don't inform each other of what's going to happen. Now, I, I, I don't say, well, whether you like it or not, you submit to me, so I'll just buy me a house and we live there. No, because if I force her, then we are not in fellowship. Okay, we are not in fellowship. That's why some, some people, some couple, one person makes a decision and the other doesn't know it. And they say they love each other. You're kidding. You know, you, you, that's a joke. If you are in fellowship, you will talk to each other and you will say what you want. Otherwise, you cannot walk together unless you agree. That is fellowship. Okay? That is fellowship. When, when uh, I had a few ministers that I'm in fellowship with going to missions, uh, anybody can talk. At the end of the day, I'm their leader. I may not talk, but I'm their leader. I remember there were a few times some of them will tell me, one of them always coming with me, hey, when, when, when I'm speaking, how many hours? I said, I'll, I'll tell you when. That's it. This time when, when uh, I went with John and his friend Matt, I was thinking maybe, it, because John has been teaching in online Bible school, I was thinking, well, maybe I'll have John speak for 30 minutes, you know. I'm nervous to have him uh, speak to these ministers for longer than that because I was telling myself, well, he's a good teacher, but what does he know, you know? This is new. You have to accept when a person is a neophyte. So, uh, but I told him, John, maybe you will, you will talk. I said, okay, I'll be ready. And I was thinking, yeah, if, if I have him speak, his uh, friend Matt will, will be upset. So I said, maybe there's no harm having him speak for 30 minutes also. I said, tell your friend Matt, just, just get ready. And so they were expecting. Well, I was teaching, and there's a few chains that I have seen, and I decided I, they're not going to talk. Yeah. And so they did not talk. That's it. There, there are people who want to present themselves, they, they want to speak in our seminars. I, if I don't want them to talk, they don't talk. Why? Because we have to, to be in the same boat. You see? Can you imagine what disaster it will be if I'll have somebody speak there and say, it's okay for the same sex to be married? That will be disaster. Then the people will be looking at me. When I was, I was uh, teaching a couple of years ago in Ifugao, and I said, you know, the Bible doesn't say, the Bible says, do not be drunk with wine. But he didn't say don't drink. In fact, I said, Paul told Timothy, the reason why you have a stomach problem is because, of course, it's amoeba, and they use wine to cleanse the water. So I said, you, the, the prohibition is drunkenness. I'll tell you, uh, I think three or four pastors stood up and walked away. Never, never returned. They're offended by that. You see? No, I can, I, I can understand the offense. But, but why is it? Because he can, they can no longer fellowship with me. Because they think there is a major rift in our doctrine. Now, that is a simple thing, and that's very clear in the scriptures. Now, can, can you imagine if, if you say you are in fellowship with some people, and yet they persist on living a different lifestyle? It will not only hurt you, it will hurt the testimony, the witness. Can you imagine if, if uh, I, I say one thing and then my wife turns around and say another thing? It will, I will lose the authority to teach the congregation. Say I tell the congregation, hey guys, you, you better discipline your kids. And my wife look at me and say, yeah, discipline them. Like I will approve it. And you can tell my kids are very undisciplined. I will lose. You will just laugh at me. You'll be polite because you're Filipinos. But you'll be laughing at me. You see, some people doesn't realize when they should stop talking. You know. Uh, so, some people don't get it. Sometimes you just have to be quiet because you have lost the authority to talk. But I will lose the authority to talk. You know, there, there were times I'll say something 
And my wife will not say something in this agreement, but after we talk with, with, with the group, she will say something to correct or to do something. I'll talk to her after the meeting and say, you want to be the pastor? I'll tell her that. You, you want to take over? I'll give it to you. Why? Because unless you share the same thing, you can't walk together. Okay? So there's some, like uh, years ago, there was one uh, couple here. I was downstairs. And, and he told me, hey, pastor, say, check your, your, your kid. That was Joseph. Discipline him. I smile at him. I, I said, uh, I, I will, but I smile. I said, because the, right, the, the guy doesn't even have the right to breathe discipline in front of me. His kids are totally undisciplined. My kids are, you know. And so it becomes funny when somebody with undisciplined kids tell me discipline your kids. Come on, go wash your face or something. You know, eat some balut and wake up. Because you lose authority. That's just the way it is. And, and when you begin to recognize that, then you can impose something and say, this is what we believe. In the church, we have what we call as constitution and bylaws. And in that constitution and bylaws, there is tenets of faith. This is what we believe. We believe in the following things. Normally, when you're looking for a church, you look at that. You don't look at anything else. You look at that because the rest is negotiable. You look at that and say, can I agree with this? Okay, can I agree with this? So the biggest fellowship of theologians in the world is ETS. They have, I don't know how many thousands of theologians part of this organization. Because the tenets of faith that they have that you agree with, they made it very simple. We believe that the word of the Lord is inspired in its autograph. That's it. So it becomes very general, no offense to anybody, but it welcomes everybody. That's why it's the biggest organization there is. Although there's a, you can question the statement, but it's a true statement, you know. But that is just the case. So now, when you say, I am in fellowship with this church or with this person, you share the same thing in common, okay? Now, in the Christian fellowship, our fellowship is in Jesus Christ. God the Father, it's in the light, okay? When we agree, then that fellowship is characterized by joy. That your joy may be complete. Okay? Look, if, if you, for example, and your wife, or whoever your family is, agree, and both parties are satisfied, after they agree, they are both happy. Joy. Because you agree. Now, if you disagree and somebody just simply say, well, I don't care what you say, I'm the head of the house or I'm the wife here. You know, you may be the head of the house, but I'm the neck. I rotate the head. Well, that's, there's going to be no joy. I really don't like that. Have you seen kids go on vacation? Hey, are you enjoying yourself? Mm, no. I, I really don't like it. Why, why are you here then? Only my mom likes it. Whoa, there is no fellowship there. I went to, uh, years ago, we went to... Uh, Florida with two other families. And my wife, I don't know what's wrong with my wife, but she likes the rides. Every time she goes on a ride, she gets pregnant. It always happens like that. That's why I don't take her on rides anymore. I don't want her to be pregnant again, you know. But uh, they were enjoying their rides, and I was just tired. It's supposed to be a vacation. I was more tired in that vacation. So we have, I think, one week, in, we rented a house, and she bought a pass, Universal Studios, and all of those studios. After, after one day, I said to Anne, uh, I'm not doing this anymore. And she said, well, we bought the tickets. I said, no, you bought the tickets, I said. And I'm, I don't like the rides. I, I'm not enjoying this. I said, let me just stay home, I said, because the house has a swimming pool. So I said, I'll just float around, you know. I think I, I can sleep. I'll be happy. And she said, we came to vacation, and she gets upset. You know, and when, when the wife gets upset, you have to listen, okay? Uh, so I listened to her, okay, I'll go. And boy, the second day was more tedious than the first day. I was watching, I don't know who's the baby. Uh, I think it's James or, is it, was it James? I was, all of them are screaming on the rides, and I was, 
pushing the... And there is... I don't know who designed that Disney thing. There, there are no benches. You, you cannot sit anywhere. Something is wrong with those people, you know. There are no benches around. I mean, there are few benches, but there are really no benches around. It's just, it's just horrible, you know. So I was standing there for around eight hours. When we eat, you, you sit down, but you're just basically standing up. I was dead tired the third day. My wife says, let's go. I said, you go yourself. I said, I agreed yesterday, not today. We have two more days of ticket. I said, eat the ticket. I, am, I don't care how much you pay there. I am tired and I'm not dying out there. And so my wife was very upset. And the kids told me, Papa, we want to stay with you in the house. Yeah, it turned out all of them are tired. Their mama tired them out, you know. And so what happened? She was forced to agree with us. And we stayed in the house. Now that gave me joy. You know? uh, fullness of joy. And we just float around the swimming pool. But you see some parents say, well, my kids like it. Really? Maybe it's the mom who likes it. <laughs> some of you are laughing. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Uh, that, that breaks the bond of fellowship. Walk. If we walk in the light, walk is the manner by which we live our lives. Walk in the Spirit. Live in the Spirit. The same thing. Therefore, when the Bible commands us to walk in the Spirit, it is commanding us to live our lives according to the Scriptures. Okay, there, we have a member here before. She was, he was caught in a nightclub. You know. So I have to sit him down and say, listen, uh, somebody saw you in the nightclub. I said, you know, it's, I'm not saying you're doing anything there. I said, but we have a problem there because you are a leader and your testimony is affected. I said, because in the nightclub, in this nightclub that they, they were seen, there were some bad things that you can see, you know. There's some uh, uh, barely clothed dancing girls, so that will be uh, wrong. And so... I, I sat him down. I said, what's up with this? And he said, oh, yes, Pastor, so I went there. I said, why did you go there? He said, oh, don't worry about me. I don't drink. I don't do anything there. I said, then why are you there? He said, I am the designated driver. Yeah. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, they'll get drunk, and they cannot drive when they're drunk. So I am the designated driver. I said, so where did you wait? In the car or inside the, the, the nightclub? Of course, inside the nightclub. I said, so you saw what they saw. Yeah, but I did not drink. I said, again, there's a problem because you may not be doing anything wrong, but others saw you. Because at one time, we have a guest here, and she, he was very happy. I can tell you where he works. I still see him from time to time. He, hey, Pastor Jose. It was Sunday morning. I said, hey, I've not seen you in a long time. Yeah, I came here because... Uh, I know some of your members here. I saw them last night in the club. I said, what do you mean? Yeah. A couple of them during that time was playing the instruments. And, and he thought it was okay. You see? Now I have to sit down those people and say, listen, this is not acceptable. Why? That's with the base of fellowship. You see, that's why not anybody, nobody can just make up their own standards. We base it on the scriptures. For, for example, the, the, the worship team they have a dress code. You have a dress code, right? They have a dress code. Can you imagine if somebody becomes a holy cow and they will just, they will just uh, put on an outfit, whatever they want, regardless of what the agreement was? He will break the fellowship. Because then others will be saying, how come he or she is dressed like that and I'm not allowed to dress like that? You see, it may not be about sin, but it breaks the fellowship. Because you walk, you share something in common. You see? That's fellowship. In our case, it's living according to the word of the Lord. The ministry of the Holy Spirit is not only to teach us the word of the Lord, but to remind us of everything that Jesus taught us. That's the link that I told you. Jesus gave us the message. The Holy Spirit makes sure that that message is preserved and passed on to us. That's why it's important for us to be able to read the scriptures. During the uh, 70s, when the charismatic revival within the Catholic Church erupted, I mean, massive 
revival. It, uh, it happened in Marquette University and Notre Dame University, University of Michigan. It went to Duke. It went to Ateneo de Manila. Yeah. And uh, the priests in Ateneo went to uh, one of the Assemblies of God ministers, who was my Sunday school teacher during that time. And he said, came to him and said, hey, we, we, there's, a, there's what you call as the Catholic charismatic movement. We got introduced to the gospel. We got born again. They, they got baptized in the spirit. They're speaking in tongues. They're Roman Catholics. It was the, the product of the ministry of a guy named David Duplicis in the 60s and 70s. Now, he said, can you please come to us? These are assemblies of God ministers. Come to our school. Come to our parish. Why? Teach us the Bible. Because we don't know the Bible. And he looked at them and says, but, but you did seminary in the Catholic Church, right? He said, yeah. You must have studied the Bible. No, we don't have time for that. There are so many uh, papal creeds and canon law that we have to study. We have no time to study the Bible. Teach us the Bible. So he went to the Assemblies of God headquarters and said, let's send some pastors and begin to teach in Ateneo and other uh, Catholic churches that, where they are open. And this is what the denomination said. If they want the Bible, they should come to us. And we will teach them. If they don't want to come to us, we can't do anything. We lost the Catholic Church that way in the Philippines. Yeah. I, I know because I have taught, I, I went to, you know, in, in uh, Divisoria, in Tondo, the uh, Santo Nino Church, big church close to uh, Mary Johnston Hospital. I used to teach there. Yeah, I used to teach in the uh, Catholic Church. Because one of my students is an active lay person there. And so I would teach there the Bible. And, and uh, in, in their hall, I, it's not a basement, but it's in their hall, bigger than this. First time I went there, I, I taught the gospel. I want to make sure they get saved. And they are singing our songs. They are clapping their hands. They are lifting their hands, you know. And so I, I gave an altar call after I taught. I said, those of you who want to be saved and want to receive Christ your Savior, raise your hands. I was surprised. Everybody raised their hands. Yeah, they're looking for assurance, and I went there a few more times, and uh, was teaching them. That's not the only Catholic church that I, I I went to teach on, because they were open. But they have to agree that I will teach the Bible. But that fellowship is is broken. Okay, so the brokenness, the the breaking is this. What about the practice? Because if we if we walk in the light, light is accountability. Light is everybody can see. You know, we can see each other right now because there is light. I can tell when somebody is sleeping. I can tell when, when somebody is bored uh, by your looks because I can see. You know, uh, and sometimes uh, you, you can write books on, on Christian humor because uh, you, don't, you don't see what I see. Uh, I'll be teaching like this and somebody will be, and I will say, say amen, amen. You know? <laughs> what in the world are you amening at, you know? Uh, now, this true story. There's an old, he's dead now. Died 103 years old. That's why I don't like, in some churches you will find the, the pastor sitting in the front. I don't like that. Because then everybody's looking at you and you're looking at everybody, you know? <laughs> so, there's an old pastor during the time, he's over 80 years old. And he was sitting down. And you know, when you're old, you fall asleep. And by the way, old people, they just don't care. <laughs> Young ones, they care. You, you think you'll be upset with an old person, it will, it will move them? No. You tell an old person, hey, don't do that. They will look at you and say, well, that's what they do. They, they, these people just don't care, you know, so don't bother. So, so uh, he, was, he was sitting down and he was falling asleep and the pastor was preaching. You know how... I mean, I'm the same, so I cannot really criticize them, but when, have, have you seen some people when they sleep, their mouths are open? And, and he was sitting up. In front of everybody, so now the people are laughing. And, and they are holding it because our pastor is American and very strict, so they are holding their laughter. Now you can only sway so much, you know. You know the law of the pendulum? When... <laughs> Well, he swung too far, and the moment you swung too far, the recovery is difficult. <laughs> Whoa, he fell down. He fell down, and this is true story. He fell down, 
and he's a true Pentecostal, after he fell down, <laughs> hallelujah, you know. <laughs> I don't know what he is hallelujahing for, you know. The guy fell asleep and knocked out. But uh, I, I see some of that in our church, you know. And so I, uh, I, I laugh inside. Uh, and then I tell the story whenever we're having lunch, you know. And we all, we have, we have a great time eating in the house because we have a lot of fun memories, you know. <laughs> so, in the previous verses, John is telling us of the revelation he received from God using the words heard, seen, observed, touched. Okay? Heard, seen, observed, touched. Now he's going to apply them in terms of having true fellowship in faith with God and the saints. He's now declaring or testifying this revelation to them. Okay. So what, what is it that he heard, uh, seen, touched, and observed? First revelation, verse 5. God is light. Say it with me. God is light. Now, light doesn't mean light color, okay? It's light, as in light like that. And the Bible says... God is light. There is absolutely, say absolutely. absolutely. That means complete. Absolutely no darkness in him. When he says, when he says absolutely no darkness in him. Can you imagine a place with light and there is no shadow? Huh? Is there a place like that? Shadow is dark. But here there is no darkness. You know, I, I, I cannot see that properly because it's a little bit dark. You cannot say that with God. God is light and there is no darkness in Him. No delusion. He is pure. Now darkness, as we have said before, concerns the matter of life. When we talk about darkness, we talk about Things that we don't want others to see. Have you heard of some people having a good time at night and they call it what? Night life. By the way, how come nightclubs open at night? Because it's a nightclub, you know. Otherwise it will be a day club. <laughs> but there are <laughs> but there are clubs that are actually open during the day. But it's the the lighting, they try to uh, duplicate the evening lighting. Why is it that they do it like that uh, in darkness? They don't want anybody to see what they're doing. Yeah. You know, in, in uh, lighting design, when I was in school studying that, two of the, two of the bright, the, the, two of the most lit areas supposedly in the house, most lit area. Number one is the kitchen. It should be well lit, very bright. Why? So that when you're cooking, you can see dirt. You can see if there are insects, bugs, every little dirt you should be able to see. Otherwise, you will put them in your ingredients. You know, if you're eating something in your house and there's a funny taste, and you know it's not part of the ingredient, your kitchen is not well lit. Okay? Something was included should not be there. The other house, the other part of the house that should be well lit, the dining ta the dining hall. Okay? Dining hall should be well lit. Why? So that when the food is served, you will know if it's dirty or not. In restaurants, it should be the same, but they don't, so that you will not see. Yeah. You know, they were, they were studying here how come uh, Americans became very gloomy, they say. Just look at a Filipino, a true Filipino, okay, not, not uh, a fake Filipino. A true Filipino living room. Have you noticed a true Filipino living room, there's a lot of light? American living rooms, there is none. What you have are torch lamps. That's one of the things I said, I was looking at houses before, I said, how come there is no light here? Oh, it's the living room. Yeah, but there's no light. Oh, there's, there's the, uh, you know. That's why when, when Ann designed our house, there's a lot of light. I mean, you will not be able to sleep uh, because the moment he turns on the light, everything is just looking at you, you know. 
But here, and, and the, uh, the American Psych Psychology Association says that because of the dimly lit living rooms, and that's where people sit down after eating, it contributes to depression. So when a psychiatrist is actually counseling somebody who's depressed, one of the things that they say is this, change the lighting where you always sit. Because if it's dark, it contributes to depression. Okay? Now, have you noticed when you are in pain, that pain seems to intensify at night time? when all the lights are off and when everybody is silent. Then you have more time to listen to your pain. It intensifies. It accelerates, okay? So this is what, 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 what they're saying. Now, in God, there is no darkness in Him. Nothing that God is doing is hidden. Yeah, nothing. Have you ever asked your spouse, where were you last night? And they won't answer it. What will happen? Where were you last night? Well, just there. Where is there? The moment they answer you, just there, immediately your antenna goes up. What, what is there? <laughs> Who are you with? Some friends. Who are those friends? You are creating doubt because you are not open. You see, you are not open. Actually, this is a simple test. When somebody asks you, where have you been last night? Where were you? You, you, you came home. You said you're going to be home at, at 8. Where were you? Well, just there. Oh, they are hiding something. What do you mean you're there? Where is there? There. Well, where is it? Well, where are you asking? You don't know where it is. That's why I'm asking, because I don't know where it is. <laughs> but you just create doubt. You know, the Bible says God will not do anything unless first he tells his servants, the prophets. Jesus said, I don't call you servants anymore. But I call you what? Friends. Because a friend knows what his friend is doing. Now, can you imagine if, for example, the spouse says, we are best, my, my, my best friend will be my wife. Okay? Uh, Paul Willie is a, is, is a very good friend of mine, but my best friend is my wife. I may not be her best friend, but she is my best friend. <laughs> but she is my best friend. Nothing hidden. The reason why I say that is because she hides something from me now. She'll tell me, so it's hard to have no more money. Well, well her favorite statement is, if my kids want something, is, it's not in the budget. So I will ask her, what budget? Do we have a budget? You, you parents, you, you tell your kids, it's, it's not in the budget. Do you really have a budget? When, when did you write the budget? What is in the budget? But we just say that to sound smart. It's not in the budget. Well, you don't have a budget. Very few people have a budget. You know? So she'll say, it's not in the budget. And my kids will be upset. And then she will disappear. <laughs> when we are newly married, I know exactly where she is at what time. She will tell me when she is stepping out of the house. Now she just disappears. And after she says, there is no budget, she will come back with a bag. Where did you get that? Oh, this one? <laughs> well, you know. I said, no, I don't know. That's why I'm asking. <laughs> you see, that's, that's, she's not walking in the light. You see, <laughs> she is hiding something. But if you are open, when somebody asks you, that's the same thing with God. Now, relate that now if we say we have no sin, we make him a liar. Because he already knows. Do you know that God knows your thoughts before you even think it? He knows where you are going before you even plan on going there. There is no use hiding anything from God. God, you know when the Bible says that in the book of Revelation, the eyes of Jesus were like flames of fire. Now, don't draw a picture of him that his eyes were, were flames. No, it means he has penetrating gaze. He looks at you, and everything is laid bare. We have an associate pastor in the Philippines, and every time, because Lester was a, is a prophet, and, 
every time Lester comes, he's out of the office. One day we were talking, I said, hey, it's, it, you know, you can, you can learn from Lester Samuel. I said, there's very few people like him on earth when he was alive. And he said, whenever Lester is around, I don't want to be around. I said, why? He said to me, have you looked at his eyes? I said, so many times. He said, I am so scared that if he look at my eyes, he will know my secrets and he will tell me. And so he avoid his eyes. Some people have that kind of gaze. They look at you and their gaze penetrates. Now, by the way, if, if you are hiding something from the person you love, you can't look in their eyes. Because the Bible says the eye is the portal of the soul. You know. If you look at somebody in the eye, you can tell a lot of things. You can tell when a person is lying, when a person is truthful, when a person is joyful. You can tell. So when I'm talking with my kids, if I'm disciplining them, I insist, look into my eyes. Because when I'm disciplining them, they don't want to look into my eyes. You see? But here, here it is. With God, there is no darkness. Everything is revealed. There is no point hiding from the Lord. We might as well walk in the light. You know, there is also accountability. This revelation that God is light tests the truthfulness of what we call as fellowship. Hey, let's go tomorrow. What are we doing? We have not been fellowshipping. Let's fellowship. You know what they mean? Let's eat together. Let's have coffee together. That is not fellowship. True fellowship is actually saying, hey, let's, let's catch up. You know, let's talk to each other. I told you about that pastor that uh, I've trained and five minutes before the seminar, he was insisting I go down. And all, all it is, is he was, he wants to spend time with me and, but too bad, he, he came late and, and he wants to show me, he's got a new, in the Philippines, guys, brand new, uh, all leather seats, Mercedes uh, sports car. And he wants to show it to me. Maybe he thought I'll be impressed. But I was in a hurry. My seminar is about to start. So I said, I nice, I said. He said, sit down. I said, no, I, I'm okay. But then I look at him and says, what about your ministry? Are you still preaching? And he stuttered. You see, now the car does not put anything in the light. I know him as a fellow minister. Therefore, I will check on his ministry. When I check on his ministry, he stuttered. He's no longer paying attention to it. You see? You cannot have fellowship. Because, for example, if I fellowship with Brother Willie, that's why I always look forward to fellowshipping with him, we talk about ministry. We talk about what we're going to be doing. We talk about how we're going to do things. We talk about the scriptures. Last time we were there, we were not able to do that. But normally, we will open the scriptures and have devotion or, or study of the scriptures together. Okay? It's fellowship. We make sure we are on the same page with our walk with God. Because the only basis of our fellowship really is the Lord. No one else. Yeah. And so if he is in the light, light, as we are in the light, then we have fellowship. If you can live however you want, and I can live however I want, we're just eating together and we're just having coffee. We are not having fellowship. Biblical fellowship is biblical partnership. You know, you cannot partner with anybody that you don't know. Look, if you are an investor, are you going to invest a million pesos on something and you don't know the person? Uh, at, at one, you know what shocked me in, in this church? There are actually some people who invest on something. I said, why did you invest that much money on that person? Well, he was introduced to me by somebody. I met him in a party. What? You met him in a party and you're willing to invest so many thousands of dollars? That's a mistake. Because you don't know the person. Why in the world will you invest on somebody's words? You just met him 30 minutes ago. That's what salesmen do. They sell things you don't need. Okay? But f there are some people in the Philippines that because I announced them we were looking for a property. Uh, there, there, was, there was one pastora. She came to me. And says, hey, Pastor Jose, I just renewed my license. I said, what license? Your, your ordination? She laughed and said, no, no, no. My uh, realtor's license in the Philippines. Oh, I said, so I can get 
a, uh, a finite property. What are your requirements? He was asking, there are people always asking me, what are your requirements? Well, I'm not really, there are a few people that I talk to, I'm really interested in talking to them, because we are on the same spirit. We, we, we know, they know what, what we want. You know, a salesperson, a realtor, they'll just sell you anything so they can make the profit. So I like working with uh, Hans Kuya because he keeps asking me, what are your requirements? I'll work with you, but what are your requirements? Because he knows, those, what are your requirements? Realtor will tell you, oh, this is good for you, this is good for you. How would they know? And, and perhaps some of you bought houses you don't want. A realtor sold it to you. It's not really what you like, okay? And after you bought it, you regret it. Because you're not in fellowship with the realtor. You need somebody that you are in partnership with that will tell you, do you have kids? Where do you plan to bring them to school? What kind of neighborhood is this? Because they are very concerned. You are in the same page. So you will notice if you talk to my wife, especially in terms of buying a house, she will tell you those things. Do you have kids? Are you planning to have kids? Where do you want to bring them to school? Where is your job? This and that. Because we are supposed to be on the same page. First of all, she doesn't make a profit by telling you these things. But this is the difference between religion and relationship with God. Religion will sell you anything. They'll sell you miracle water. You know. I know in the church, they come up with all kinds of uh, merchandise. Uh, they, can you imagine now they're selling on television uh, water of Agua Vida, uh, water of life. You send $20, we'll give you a little bottle of water and it will heal you. That's a lot of garbage. Yeah. It's not even science. Can you imagine? Can you really believe somebody will give you water and you will be healed? My goodness. Learn a little bit of science. It's not there. Okay? But you have been hoodwinked. And you just got to know the person five minutes ago. And he's telling you he's a millionaire. Check his life. He's probably buried in debt. That's why he's in a hurry to sell you something. So he can pay out a little bit of their debts. But that happens in real partnership. In real partnership, you study the person. Remember when, we were, when I was borrowing money for this uh, church? I was borrowing $1.2 million. I asked for two and a half. They only gave me $1.2 million. On the last interview, they sent an accountant to come here, and we met here. Uh, all the questions that she asked was not about the finances of the church. Yeah. It was not about the finances. She never asked me about the finances of the church. She asked me about who I am. I was analyzing what in the world is this kind of interview. Where did you study? How long have you been a pastor in the Philippines? Ask for my references. She was verifying whether I can be a true partner with Chase. You know why Chase doesn't like to partner with churches? They don't pay. Yeah. They, they ask for, can, can, we, can we extend? Can we do this? And they tell those financial people, we do it by faith. They don't understand that. They just count numbers. Yeah. Chase at one time pull away from churches. That's why we pull away from it. They don't like to finance churches anymore. But that interview, my wife is here, I was saying, she never asked me anything about the finances of the church. She was asking me who I am. Because I'm about to enter into a partnership. I'm borrowing money and I'm going to return money. That's a big deal. You see? Now, that's why when somebody tells you they are a Christian, you don't listen to the words. Okay? You know their doctrine and their life. This is what Paul said to those uh, whom he wrote letters to. He said, you know my doctrine and my manner of life. This is where we get our fellowship. I cannot, that's why I keep announcing it more today because of the difficulties of finances. I keep announcing now in my seminars, I don't like guest speakers in our church. I just don't. Because you have, you have a lot of ministers that will come to the U.S. and is just looking for churches where they can stop to collect money. 
They have standard preachings, they have standard sermons that will make you cry and move you emotionally so they can get money from you. Have you noticed those who raise funds, they always make you cry? They always make you sad. They want you to be sympathetic. They want to get your money. And they ask me, are you going to take a separate offering from me? I don't like those. Why? I don't like people second, take, taking second offering from you. All I want is for you guys to be faithful with your tithes and, and if you have leftover offerings, and we'll manage that. But in a lot of circles, they make this into a business. They go in a circuit, just travel. We are not in fellowship. We have different spirits. Now, I like people who teach the word of the Lord. That's the same spirit as I, as I have. So when you say you are in fellowship with somebody, what are you in fellowship with? I cannot fellowship, the Bible says in the writings of, with demons. You see, when you worship idols, you worship demons, that's what the Bible says. You cannot fellowship with that. You know? That's why one time, Anna's relatives came to the house, we entered, we, we hosted them, and they started putting statues of their little gods, you know? This size. They put it, and my kids saw it. Papa, what are those? Because I teach no idolatry. Well, because my kids saw that, I have to take my stand. So I said, hey, listen, you're welcome here, but none of those idols, your gods are too small, you know. My hands are bigger than your gods. How, how in the world am I going to worship a god this big? My hands are bigger, okay. And the guy doesn't talk. If it falls over, it doesn't stand up, you see. And I was teaching my kids none of those things. Oh, they get upset. Doesn't matter to me. We're not in fellowship. Yeah. My God says, no idols, no idolatry. That's where I'm in fellowship with. Now, some Christians can, can, uh, can uh, explain themselves. Explain all you want. Be happy. Okay? My Bible still says, thou shalt not make any graven image. And by the way, when you say graven image, nothing changed. You know when they say graven image, archaeology, you know how big those graven images are? This big. Yeah, what they dug up in uh, archaeology, idols this big. They can't afford big ones. Big ones are in the temples. So really in houses, nothing changed. It's still the same today. I cannot have fellowship with those people. Why? Because our fellowship has to be based on the Lord, on His Word, and on Jesus Christ. So walking in the light is the base of our fellowship with God and with one another. So John solicits this commitment. You want to fellowship with me, John says. Walk in the light. Yeah. You know, we Filipinos say, okay lang yan. Not with God. We sometimes say, well, this, this is okay. Just forget it, you know. We're all human beings. We're all going to the same place. No, 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 it's not. There is one way, there is one truth, there is one life. Any aberrant lifestyle that is opposite to the scriptures is not from God. You cannot have biblical fellowship with those. When John solicits this, this uh, commitment, he says, walk in the light. The idea that he has is this, from the, from the language and from the grammatical analysis, the idea is this, you are in darkness. By the way, if you are in darkness... And say, I don't know where I'm going. Before we got born again, we were in darkness. I don't know where, where I'm going. And then you saw a little light. You want to know where you're going. You saw a little light. What will you do? Approach the light, right? Well, I, I'm in darkness right now. I, do, I don't know where I'm going. You saw a little light. So you approach the light. When you approach the light a little bit, you, you see more. Wow, this is good. I can see more. So you approach a little bit more. And then you saw more. You approach a little bit more. And then you see the options. You, that is light. Walking in the light doesn't mean you are walking from afar. This is the quality of light. Light attracts. The more you see light, the more you want to get closer. Because the more you see, the more revelation you have, the more knowledge you have. That is our relationship with God. If you are walking with the light, the more you will press to know God. You know, sometimes you wonder, how come somebody grew up in the church and then they, they just turn around and they're no longer walking the light for, 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 for some time? Yeah. 
they are no longer walking in the light for some time. Look, the closest friends supposedly is the husband and the wife. I mean, look when they're dating, you know, at least during the time when we're dating. Even if I don't have a cell phone, I use the red phone, you know. Uh, it's not the Russian phone, it's, it's the coin phone, you know. I, I, know the, I know the public phones around my area. I know the public phones where nobody knows and very few people use this because then I can spend more time, you know. But after I have a date with my wife, I want to talk to her some more. And then I want to be with, and be with her until you say, I want to get married. Because dating is no longer good. The dating is good when you are getting to know each other. But there comes a point in your relationship saying, I don't like dating anymore. I want to get married. So you get closer. Now this is the lousy thing. After you get married, what do you do? You step away from each other. Oh, hindi na makawala yan, you know? So we step away. That is the mistake. Walking in the light is, the more you see the light, the more you want to approach. You know? The more you want to approach. Uh, to this day, I still find myself just looking at my wife. I know we are both getting old, you know? I'm, I'm a little bit older than her. But I will, I will just look at my wife and say, you know, Anne, I, you are really more beautiful today than the first time I saw you. And she will say, Nambobola ka lang. I said, don't worry, my eyes are uh, dimmer now, you know. You cannot see anymore like, like, like before. It adjusts, you know. Uh, but really, it, it amazes me that this woman can live with me for over, for over two decades now. I mean, we're, we're almost going to hit 30 years. That's a long time. You know, you get married in uh, 1994. That's a long time to be married. Yeah. Some of you are not even born in 1994. You were born in this century. Yeah. But, but it amazes me that she still serves me. Even though she yells at me more today, she's still patient. You know, she's slower now because I, I used to, 2 a.m., and I'm hungry. What do you want? And she will stand up. Now I'll say, and I'm hungry. Uh, I'm hungry. Uh, and I'll be upset. And she will tell me this, sweetheart, I'm no longer a spring chicken. What are you now? A fall chicken. You know? <laughs> All the hairs are falling off. Yeah. But this is, this is the thing. You see? But, but I really believe we are closer now than ever before. You know why marriages, you drift apart? You stop approaching each other. Yeah. You know why, why uh, our relationship with the Lord drifts apart? We stop reading His Word. We stop getting excited with God. We take, that's why some of you even leave your Bible in the church and you don't even know you left it. You know, and you come to church and you, you go to your the same seat. Oh, my Bible is still here. Thank God, I thought I forgot. You forgot for one week, guys. And you said, I thought I forgot. You did forget. You see? You take it for granted. You are no longer walking in the line. That's why you drift apart. But if we are, look, if we are all walking in the light, we'll be talking the same, about the same thing. You know, I struggled with this. Last week I was tempted on this one. Accountability. Yeah, it happened to me years ago, and this is what I did. So now nobody can say, well, it doesn't happen to me after I get born again. I don't say anymore. No, because if you say you have no sin, then you make it a liar. And you are, you are deceived. We know we sin. We compare notes, and we, we ask each other, how do we overcome? You know, right now, they are now uh, making the case of Ukraine as a, as a case study on how to resist a mighty force like Russia. And, and now if you listen to the news, they're saying, this, this resistance in Ukraine will be a case study in military academies. Because this is the second most powerful army in the world, a tiny little Ukraine in armed forces, resisted it, and it's now pushing back. It will be a classic. It will be a classic. It will be studied in military academies. Why? 
Because we want to compare notes. If you want to be victorious, we want to compare notes. So walking in the light uh, admits or recognizes that light and darkness are not compatible. And they will never be compatible. This is the problem with compromise. We don't know our standards, so we keep compromising. Light and darkness are not compatible. When light comes, darkness has to go. Darkness cannot be where light is. Light can invade darkness. Okay, people say, well, well, I can invade light. No, light has to be turned off for darkness to prevail. But you cannot, darkness cannot invade light. But light invades darkness. And when light invades darkness, light, darkness flees. So when light came into your life, when the gospel came, darkness has to flee. If you say, well, darkness remains, then light was turned off. Somewhere you stop walking in the light. And this is the test of fellowship. It's signaled by the conditional particle if in verse 6. If we say we have fellowship with him, if we say we love him, if we say we have fellowship with one another, then we walk in the light. So now look at this. I'm fellowshipping with this brother, and I say, hey, listen, I'm, I'm struggling with my son. My, my son suddenly became very rebellious. And the person is from, oh, I know what you mean. I went through that. He did not come in condemnation. I went through that episode in my life. And this is what we did. We read the Bible, or we did the following things. We sat down with our child, and we set the standard, and this is what we did. And after some time, it got corrected. You see? What if, say, you know, my son is being rebellious. Oh. And you talk to an unbeliever. Oh, you can't do nothing about it. It's part of growing pains. And by the way, prepare yourself. He may make somebody pregnant. Be ready to, pre to pay for it, you know? And, 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 you know, the police may call you and say that he was found with drugs. So you may bail him out. Be prepared. That is not fellowship. Why would I want to talk to a person like that with no solution? I want to talk to somebody and say, hey, listen, I'm struggling with my son. He comes to me and say, ha, I remember that. I remember when my boy was still young and he was going through the same rebellious stage. This is what we did. I'm telling you, do what I did and it will be okay. You see? Have you noticed I've said that several times in my sermons all throughout the years? If you read your Bible the way I read my Bible, if you pray the way I pray, you will be okay. If you discipline your kids the way I discipline my kids, family will be okay. I keep saying that. I'm giving you a solution that I found from the scriptures. But some of you became so smart. You look at the psychiatrist and psychologist, or oh, Dr. Spock says that. Let's beam it up. Let's go to the moon. You know? And they are not quoting to you the scriptures. They are not quoting you the truth. <laughs> Remember my, my, our former church? Oh, pastor said can preach like that because he doesn't have kids. Well, I start having kids. Oh, he's preaching like that because his kids are not teenagers yet. They became teenagers. Well, they have nothing more to say. Yeah. Now, nobody can tell me anymore, wait till they become teenagers. Joseph is no longer a teenager. He's now a tatang ager, you know? <laughs> Too slow. Won't get married right away. John is no longer a teenager. Are you still a teenager? You're 12 years old, right? No. <laughs> yeah. James is trying to grow faster. Maybe I'll slap him harder, you know? But, uh, no, they, they have gone to the stage. And nobody can say it to me, but they used to tell me that. And they tell me this. Wait, pastor said, till they become teenagers. And the boys starts running with girls. No, my boys don't. They, they don't play around with girls. You know why? We walk in the light. And ask them what I do when I see darkness. I force it out. Now, some of you may be saying, well, you know, that's too much. Yeah, that's what happened to your kids, because it's too much. Look, what I'm telling you is something I never learned in school. It's something that I struggle because my fellow ministers don't practice it. And so I look at the scriptures, and I told the Lord to teach me. 
I begin to see these things from the scriptures. And there were times I'll be obeying the scriptures and I will just be biting my lips and say, will it work? I have some doubt, but I obey the scriptures and it worked. You know? Now, in spite of all of that, you have heard me say this, they can backslide. All of my kids can backslide. Why? Because I'm not a fool. It happened to the best of them. And because I know they can backslide. I am doing my due uh, diligence. I am making sure that they don't backslide. I don't treat them as gods. I don't treat them as bosses. I just don't. Because I know that naughtiness is in the heart of every child. And only a rod of discipline can drive it out. But some of us decided we are smarter than that. And even though we have seen tons of examples of failing families, we keep following them. We keep finding excuses. I refuse to find excuses. I made, maybe I made more mistakes than you guys did. But I just zero in the scriptures. I see a little light here. I keep approaching the light. Now it becomes a little brighter. I approach the light even more. I approach. Now I am praying to the Lord for different things on my kids. I'm praying that for my kids who will get married, that the Lord will prepare their spouse. And I told God I don't want them to be married to an unbeliever. You know? Can they choose an unbeliever? Of course they can. Yeah. What, what, what will you do, Pastor, say, if they choose an unbeliever? Well, I'm not going to shake hands with the devil. You know? But I told him that. Don't break my heart. Don't, don't bring an unbeliever in my house. You see? These are the things that I recognize and I keep approaching the light. I keep approaching the light. I keep approaching the light, you know. And, and when you do that, then the more revelation you will get, and the more you realize, oh, as I realize, without the grace of God, none of us can survive. None. You know. We need the overwhelming grace of the Lord. And it is always available to us. It's us for the taking. That's why we need to humble ourselves before God and say, Lord, I may not understand it, but this is what, what your word says. I'll do it. When we do that, God will make sure that the word will fulfill the purpose for which he sent it. And you will see results in your life. Amen? Well, that's enough talk. Let's all stand.